I appreciate that uh, invitation. Gentlemen and ladies, thanks for participating today. We're gonna to cover up geothermal, just basically what it's about, making sure we get the right equipment for you when you do your installs or selling the equipment. So we are glad you're with us today. With Bosch's history, are involved in many aspects. As you probably are aware, we are big in the automotive division with brakes, yaw, pitch, roll, all the safety devices, uh, working with Tesla, automotive, hand tools, appliances, dishwashers, many aspects. And everything holds a high standard, and the GEO has got to be held up to that same accountability as well. So the manufacturing plant for GEO happens to be that little green dot down there in Florida. That's for Fort Lauderdale. Uh, been started there for a while, and it works out very well. As you look across the map, there are 540 different locations that we're located at, but GEO is in the States. So we got ourselves the start of Florida heat pump back in 1970, Pompano Beach, mostly it's always started in small mom pop shop garages and uh, it's continued to grow. So in 2007, Bosch purchased FHP and became Bosch. They didn't do a lot of changes in the beginning to see what we had, but we made a lot of changes recently. And that's what we're gonna cover today. Some of the changes that have been made from the beginning of time. This is just another day for Lauderdale. As you take a look at the picture, we have a lot of hand experience processes going on. There's not robots, there's nothing that's uh, robotic type applications, welding, brazing, et cetera. These are water to water heat pump coaxials are being laid out and put together on the counter. This is your bullpen. These are people that are gonna assist you. Uh, they are Edgeton, George, or Jorge. Omar and Alfredo. When you call these guys, you're gonna to have to have the model number and serial number of the unit you're working on. In the early days with FHP, George Jorge was around since the beginning of time. So if you have an older piece of equipment, you need to have the serial number. We were not a job, we were not a shop that worked strictly from a, a standard format. We would build as requested. And as we would build as requested, we need to have the serial number to reference the build material, the parts material, so we can get you the right replacement parts and that'll happen. As well, they're gonna recommend or ask for heat of extraction, heat of rejection. When it comes to geo, geothermal by far is the easiest to diagnostic, easiest to figure out what's going on, even more so than what the IDS units are at this point. We have a little formula. This formula is one that was taken from the boiler industry. In H -E or HR, you would substitute that for BTUH. So it's BTUs per hour equal the gallon per minute times the delta T. That's the temperature difference of water in, water out. And then the brine factor. Normally it's considered 500 or 485. That brine factor is actually a built up formula to come up with that 500. So our formula says BTUs per hour when moving gallons per minute. We have different time factors involved. So we have to take that 60 minutes times the weight of one gallon of water, which is 8.33 pounds. And that's how you come up with the 500. Antifreeze, the specific gravity is a little under that one. That's how we're coming up with 8.08 .08 pound per gallon times 60 is 485. We then shut our desuperator off, make sure we're operating the second stage. You should be operating for five minutes and always use the same gauges instrumentation when you're doing these calculations. If you use two thermometers and that one thermometer is off just one degree, it'll make a unit that looks really good to make the unit that looks really bad. So that's kind of critical when keeping our processes done. Realistically, the tools needed to check out a heat pump if they have PT ports, pressure temperature ports, is going to be a thermometer and a pressure gauge or a flow tool. So what do we have? Bosch has two stage heat pumps, single stage heat pump, split systems, water to water, top of the line, premier two stage, and we even have some accessories as A coils, hydronic coils, and air handlers. We're gonna cover most of those today. So let's start with GEO. A lot of times we say, what is GEO? GEO is actually energy captured from the sun, it's solar. It's not going after the hot rocks. We're not going in the core of the earth. And what's really 
interesting with geo is every day that energy field is being renewed by the sun. Every day it's shining, we're taking that energy in. Constantly being replaced. You really cannot import or export that. It just happens in your own yard. We're harvesting it. This slide shows how much energy is being captured. Roughly 50%. A lot of times we say, well, gee whiz, what happens if the sun goes away? If the sun goes away, we got a lot more problems in our hands than just geothermal for sure. So that energy has been around for a long time. We're harvesting it and it does a super job. So we came up with a couple sheets. This is a geothermal made easy check off sheet, check sheet. What this check sheet is meant to do is when you have a request for a geo as a contractor, as a counterperson, as a wholesaler, if you fill the sheet out, you're not going to make any mistakes on getting the equipment. In. If you don't fill out the sheet, there are some chances are left to be made. So this sheet consists of a couple of things. We're going to take a quick look at it, and then we're going to go back to it later on. This sheet's going to have questions such as the job name, the date, the team member, BTUs, heat loss gain, heat loss, um, solar gain, I should say, and heat loss. We got our tonnage calculations all the way through the sheet. And you see briefly what we got. All these questions are going to be answered through this PowerPoint presentation. And our goal is with this sheet filled out, when you order the equipment in, it will come in with the right product. There will be no mistakes in that process. So that is the, the purpose of that. Okay. So the starting point, always need a starting point. We should be doing heat loss, heat gain before you sell equipment. Hopefully today, if someone comes in and is asking for a boiler, a furnace, a geothermal heat pump, or any piece of equipment, we do a heat gain, heat loss. If we just replace it with what's existing, we will probably be grossly oversized. And that is fact. We, we have to do the heat loss and heat gain. There's been some cases where contractors have gone to court because of oversizing equipment or undersizing equipment without a heat loss, heat gain. You really don't know where you stand. Some con, some contractors will get their wholesalers, their reps to do it for them, but the best application is for the contractor to do itself. That way he knows what's going in or she knows what's going in, that if a homeowner would question that contractor as to why they chose a piece of equipment, they can say, because your heat loss or heat gain, we chose this. Rather than saying, I really don't know, my wholesaler did it for me. You're more in tune with the game. So when it comes to delivery, we have a couple ways we can do geo. We can do an all air delivery. That'd be a water to air heat pump, or we can do a water to water, or we can do a water to air and water to water in a mixed installation. Examples I can give you of this process would be maybe a 1500 square foot home, single story with air duct running throughout the home. That would be a water to air. Another application might be a 5,000 square foot home, multiple levels, bonus rooms above the garage. That would be better suited for a water to water application. In my own home, I have nine ton of equipment, 3,500 square foot home, a thousand square foot garage detached 40 feet away from the home. It is a water to water system. We have in-floor radiant tubing poured in the, con in the basement here in the concrete much as what you see on the right-hand side picture, with two inches of overpour. So my floor was already poured. We poured two additional inches of concrete, putting down a non-oxygen barrier PEX tubing, bubble full bubble, tap con screws, and we keep the basement today basically at 70 degrees all winter long. It's being heated with the geo. Upstairs, there's an air handler in the attic, and we have an air handler located out in the garage, 40 feet away from the house. It's all being supplied by the water to water. Heat cooling and domestic water cost is about $700 a year. To heat cool this house and garage, we're paying about eight cents a KW. It'd be very hard for me to match that efficiencies with a water to air with what I can do with water to water. And we'll go through that process a little bit more later on. On the bottom left-hand side of the picture, you see 
where it says heating, design heating load. That is a software. It's a Bosch Geo Solution software that is available. It's located on the Bosch Pro HVAC jobs or on Bosch Pro HVAC com website. Under the admin tab, you can download the software. And that is a soft, a awesome software that allows you the capabilities to calculate energy cost, operating cost, size of the equipment, how much loop build I should put in, what is my loop going to perform at, and what are soil profiles for the town that I'm choosing. So there's a lot of information that are available for the contractor to use to size that loop build. When we do this process, we have to choose what are we going to go with, our heating load or, or our coaling load. Expo originally stated you should never oversize your air conditioning load more than 25% for the heating load. To put that in perspective, in Western PA, not uncommon to have 60,000 BTUs of heat load needed and 25,000 BTUs of AC needed. So if our 20,000, 25, if we listen to the design, we would size it based on a two ton load of AC. With a five ton load of heat, it would not perform very well. We'd have expensive electric bills in process. So pretty much they've gone back. IGSPA International Ground Source Heat Pump Association has stated you size now based on your total capacity, which is your dominant load. And your S of ACA still states you should not size over 25% of your air conditioning load. The concern is for dehumidification. With the onset of two stage heat pumps, we are able to match up the second stage for our heating or AC load, and then the first stage for the off season load. So we, we still size for dominant loads today. When doing this process, our loop builds are designed for a minimum of 30 degrees for wintertime operation, maximum of 100 degrees for summertime operation. 30 degrees would be in PA, 100 degrees might be down in Fort Lauderdale or Miami. You have to choose where you're going to be. The software will tell you what your priority is based on the amount of loop going in. So if you're using the BOSS software, it's going to tell you you need 900 foot of loop to heat this home, you need 500 foot of loop to AC the home. So in that case, you would be heating dominant. You really should not exceed those applications. We look at this range. For our neck of the woods, we're about 52 degree ground temperature in this location. If you think of geo, how hard would it be to heat your home if it's 52 degrees outside? How hard would it be for you to air condition your home if it's 52 degrees outside? That's what geothermal uses as its primary source. That temperature will drop as we get in toward of our end of our heating season. It'll rise during the peak of our AC season. When I compare that to an air to air heat pump, such as the IDS, the air to air heat pump is exposed to ambient conditions, minus four degrees. Geo, 52 degrees. In the winter, 52 in the summer. If I had both heat pumps operating side by side with a 52 degree day air to air and 52 degree wild groundwater with geo, the operations would be the same. They'd be economically the same. But that's what geo does. It protects the environment. There's no Aesthetic loss, no equipment sits outside. Heaven forbid if a hurricane or tornado comes through, it could wipe out the structure of the house, the equipment, but the pipes that are embedded in the earth would still be salvaged. Some of the options. Options are electric strip heat. We just don't come with it. It just doesn't happen naturally. You have to make that decision if you want it. There are some different terms. We have what we call backup heat, and we have what we call supplemental heat. Backup heat is what's needed in air to air heat pumps. In an air to air heat pump, we know that when our temperatures get down to minus four, the heat pump's going to shut off. 
when heat pump shuts off, and it requires a backup heat. In geo, we don't shut our heat pump off, say at minus four, it never shuts off. We call that supplemental heat. Supplemental heat means if I design my home for minus 10 and it goes to minus 20, my heat pump's still gonna operate. My heat pump may not be able to keep my home at 70 degrees, it might be able to maintain 68. So if I want to maintain 70, I have to add supplemental heat to do that. Here again, the Bosch Geo Solutions will make that calculation for you. It tells you right now in this case, at 4.5 degrees above zero, we'll need five kW of supplemental heat. And heat pump's gonna handle 98% of my total heating for the winter without strip heat. Should I choose backup? I wanna have enough heat to back up my heat pump in case of compressor failure, I would need 17 kW. So the software will do those calculations for you. Typically, supplemental heat is usually around 5 kW or less. How do we size that electric heat? Great question. Many of you probably are aware of this. If you don't know it, you might want to take notes and write this down for your references. For every watt of power, we get 3.413 BTUs of energy. For every watt of power, 3.413 BTUs. So if I have 45,000 BTUs as my heat loss, I divide it by 3.413, and then divide that by 1,000, we come up with 13.1 kW. We don't have a 13.1, we have a 15 kW. That's the amount of heat needed as a backup. So if you don't want to use the software and you want to do it calculation-wise, you can do it that way. If you want to use the software, you can do that and we'll calculate it for you as well. Heat exchangers, there are two styles. We have a copper and a cooper nickel. The cooper nickel is a lot of the Full cell distributors are stocking it because it's universal. Cooper nickel can go into a closed loop system, an open loop system, a boiler tire system, pretty much any application. Cooper nickel is more robust. Cooper nickel can handle 1,500 parts per million on total dissolved solids. Copper can handle 1,000 parts per million on total dissolved solids. Cooper nickel can go from a pH of 5 to 9. Copper can go from a pH of seven to nine. And there are velocities of flow. Eight foot per second in copper, 12 foot per second in cooper nickel. It's more robust, it's a harder metal. It doesn't have the heat transfer like copper, but it will last in a more harsh environment. Copper typically is a closed loop system. The best way to describe that would be like an antifreeze in the car. Where it's a closed loop, you keep recirculating the same solution over and over in that loop field. All geos should have antifreeze in them, even the ones in Florida. Realizing the purpose of that antifreeze is protecting the coaxial heat exchanger. The coax heat exchanger is a small 13 foot piece of pipe coiled up inside the compressor section, inside the heat pump in the home. When I'm in the wintertime mode and I'm pulling heat from the ground, that is the cold part. In the summertime, the cold part would be in the home. If we would lose water flow, if we'd have a problem with airflow, uh, depending on water to water or water to air, you could have a freeze up occur and take out the heat exchange. If the heat exchanger is ruptured, that mixes water and refrigerant together, usually the system is pretty much scrap at that point. Not a great position that we want to be in. You have to make that decision going in. Are you going to go copper nickel or are you going to go copper? HRP, heat recovery package. The HRP on our SM units are included. Even the SMC, which is a little more sophisticated on HRP, it makes it much more energy efficient. You can choose at what temperatures or where you want it to work at. 
but it is exclusive to the geo. What it is, is a small three foot piece of coaxial heat exchanger spiral tubing coming off the compressor discharge. It then has domestic water running through the center of the coil, refrigerant running around the outside. And our compressor discharge is heating in the heat mode and in the AC mode. The nominal capacity of that HRP is 10% of the total output capacity. So if I have a six ton heat pump, 72,000 BTUs per hour, my output on my HRP would roughly be 7,200 BTUs per hour. That is hour of operation. RG superheaters or hot water generators, the heat recovery package is supplemental. It's not dedicated. It gives you domestic water while the heat pump is running. If the heat pump doesn't run, you have no domestic water capabilities and you need to go back to your elements. To put that in perspective, if I had a 40 gallon tank of water, I needed to heat that water up from 60 degrees to 120 degrees. That'd be a 60 degree rise. If I have 40 gallons of water, and we know the definition of a BTU is the amount of heat needed to raise one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit at sea level. So my ballpark, my 40 gallon tank at 8.33 gallon would be 320 and change. We're gonna make it 300 pounds of water for simple math. As an instructor, we can do that. So I have 300 pounds of water and I gotta go 60 degrees. 60 times 300 is 18,000 BTUs. I need 18,000 BTUs of energy to raise that tank to 40 gallon of water, 60 degrees additional from 60 to 120. If I'm relying on my six ton heat pump to do that, and I'm getting 7,200 BTUs per hour, that's a continuous operation or a cumulative, I would need to be running approximately two and a half hours that day to recover the energy in that tank to heat that water. This is kind of like the, the tourist in the hare. The turtle will get there eventually. The rabbit's faster. So it's not for quick recovery, it's for the long count. And it is very energy savings, typically somewhere between four to $600 a year can be realized in savings with the desuperheater, depending on your energy cost and other conditions. Water quality is a major impact. If the water quality is poor, you're not gonna wanna hook it up. Even though it comes with the equipment such as the SM, if my water condition is poor, do not install a fuse, do not pipe it up, and it's fine. It'll work just without the water process going in. You won't get the domestic water feature of it, but that's important. As well as we talked about briefly on the open loop, closed loop, and boiler tire systems, water quality is a very critical item, even with our aluminum-based boilers. If the water quality is bad, it's going to have an effect on the heat pump. The easiest ways to take a look at that is when you walk into a structure, if you look in the sinks, you see a blue and green stain in the sinks. That is copper being ate away by a low pH water. In other words, your, your water is acidic. It would not be a candidate for domestic water heating, such as the hot water, the heat recovery package, hot water generator, the superheater. It would not be a candidate for open loop as well. If you take a look at the shower head, and the shower head has a calcium lime scale buildup. That's considered hard water. That is also not a candidate for the superheater, the heat recovery package, nor is it a candidate for the open loop. So water quality is important. Sometimes when you're doing a well system and the water quality is not the best, you're better to have it brought in in 55 gallon drums of water from a central plant from a city water system. Typically systems hold somewhere between 70 and 100 gallon of water. Realizing that if you put sandy water in that system, it's gonna be recirculated from now to the end of time. And that sand will eventually eat away the heat exchanger and create a failure. One of the options available is hot gas reheat. 
no longer available in a residential line, but is available in the commercial line. Hot gas reheat is basically what you would see at Home Depot or Lowe's with a small dehumidifier. We have our coil on the back of the heat pump, which is the, chill, the cool coil, the chilling coil. That is where we chill the air coming into the heat pump. And then right after that, we have our reheat coil or our condenser coil, the hot gas rejection coil. And what happens is we're going to bring that cool air, we're going to bring that air into the heat pump, we're going to cool it down and then reheat it back up. When we cool it down, we pull the moisture out of the air. And our discharge air is typically about five degrees warmer than what we come in with. In other words, in this application, if I had 70 degree air coming in, I'd be going out about 75 degree air. We have a three-way mixing valve that can allow that heat to either go to the ground loop or go to the coil. Floor motors, we have the three that are out there, PSC, constant torque, and constant CFM. Such as the SM unit, the only option is a constant CFM ECM motor. On the SL, I'm sorry, the SV, LV, you can have a PSC motor on the smaller horsepower units, the half ton, three quarter ton, et cetera. We have a code sheet that we're going to bring up shortly that will show you what are the options available for the equipment you're working with. The picture here shows a constant CFM ECM motor. The back module is mounted to that motor has a 16 pin connector that goes into the module, but takes out these mostly are surges and lightning strike. The module can be changed without changing the motor. Some additional options, EMS relay, energy management system relay. If you get into a sophisticated control layout for DDC or et cetera, and you don't want to tie into that, you can order an EMS relay, and what you instruct the control company to do is to give you a 24 volt signal to that relay to turn the heat pump on. So that is an EMS relay. We have a pump valve relay as well that will operate off a of Y call instead of the compressor contactor. Normally we run our, our pumps off the compressor contactor. That is a benefit that if the compressor would lock out, our water flow won't continue to go if you have city water or open loop. If you tie it off the Y call, the compressor goes out on safety, the water will continue to run. And you'll use a lot more water, more electricity, not as efficient. We have approved water flow switch, which is nothing more than a piece of pipe that goes between the inlet and the outlet of the heat pump a pressure switch between the two pipes. When the heat pump is running, there will be a pressure difference. Water in, water out. Proper flow rate will be about five to six pound of pressure difference. If we see it, my heat pump continues to run. If we do not see that difference, the heat pump shuts off. It's a safety built into it. And then the last is the comfort alert. The comfort alert is made by Emerson. It has three choke coils on it that run the run, common, and start wires of the compressor through it. It's looking for a certain amperage when the unit's running. If it doesn't see that amperage, it'll trip a light to say no amperage was found on the run wire. Compressor windings open, internal overload open. Unit has been running for three days continuously. Charge may be low. Valves inside the compressor effective. It does not shut it down. It does not do anything other than alert the technician to what might be going on with the system. It is self-resetting. Once the condition's clear, it'll clear the lights and go back to normal. DDC is also important that we have that available. Smart start. <clears throat> I have one of these in the home, and I will tell you it radically changes the amount of inrush current from what I've seen. A six ton heat pump would pull 180 amp of inrush momentarily, split second on startup. My three ton would pull 90 amp. With the smart start, my amperages have dropped to 30 on the three ton and 60 on the six ton. 
it takes it down to about 10 amp per horsepower, 10 amp per ton. That is a significant difference if you want to back up with a generator, if you're trying to eliminate some of the light blink. My three ton no longer blinks my lights. The six ton kicks on, there's still a momentary little bit of a light blink. 60 amps is still a good amount of power that's being pulled in. To put that in perspective with the IDS, the IDS inrush is about a half amp. So that is what inverter technology can do compared to a Ultratech scroll application. Other options may be requested. Bosch can fill those options in for you if need be. We're not the job shop we used to be, but we still can do custom built stuff if there's enough volume to warrant the cost. So how do we order this unit? I'm glad you asked. Every unit has a code sheet. This happens to be an SM code sheet. We'll enlarge it so you can go through that briefly. As you're coming down the list, the first digits are SM. That would be the model. It could be an SM, LM, BP, CE, whatever model it's going to be listed. The second two digits are the capacity. That is AC capacity or open loop capacity. That's not necessarily heating capacity. When you look at these numbers, if I chose an 048, an 048 will give me 48,000 to chilling, 48,000 to heating at 50 degree water. However, at 30 degree water, my output will be about 36,000. We lose almost a ton of capacity at 30 degrees. So going back to the first question on that checkoff sheet, is it a heat load gain or heat loss? Do you want four ton of cooling or four ton of heating? Is this an open loop? Is it a closed loop? What is the water temperature you're gonna design this for? Important questions. So our charts always will give you the AC capacity and heat at 50 degree would be identical. Go to True Geo closed loop application where our loops can get down in that 30, 35 degree range. You can drop almost a full ton of capacity when you hit those water conditions. Only option 2A 230 volt. We have a horizontal vertical configuration. You got your coax options, copper, or cooper, nickel. That's a critical import. You have to make that decision if you want longevity with the heat pump. Front connections are where the water is located. Left and right hand return, another important factor that should be spelled out on a checkoff sheet. When you face the front of the unit, where the controls are at, if that coil is located on the left hand side, that's considered a left hand return. If the coil is located on the right hand side, it's considered a right hand return. You need to spell it out. If you don't spell it out, it's going to come in left hand return. You cannot change them in the field. Our discharge air to options, top and bottom. There is no bottom on SM, so it's either top or end and horizontal. We have a constant CFM motor. It comes with a DuraGuard stainless steel pan. Revolution or revision levels. We have an A, B, and now a C. The C is available in vertical and horizontal. The C has a computer-based programming feature. You can go in and set a lot of your parameters with that Rev C. It does require a tablet or a computer to install and to do diagnostics. You have to download the Bosch Easy app, and from the Easy app, you can set parameters for freeze protection, for comfort mode or economy mode for electric heat strips coming on, choosing how to protect the loop field. All kind of options are available with Rev C. We have electric heat, we have our cabinetry. So every piece of equipment will have a code sheet like this to order from. As we go down through this process, even down in the MERV filter racks, heat recovery package is it's standard now, 75EA. If there's an option on there that you want that's not listed, it's not available for that unit. They've taken these 40 digits on the code sheet and broke it down to about 50 different SKUs. What Bosch used to have was 1,500 different options, 1,500 different combinations. They now broke it down to about 50. So you find the you want working off the code sheet, then you go into that 
order the price book and find the 10 digit code that will allow you to order this piece of equipment. It's all by simplicity. How do we bring it together? We set our check sheet beside the other one and we start maxing up our numbers. Going back to the code sheet, <clears throat> the checkoff sheet, I should say. So you want to be very clear. Is it heat loss, heat gain, you're sizing? If a contractor comes in and says, just give me a five ton heat pump, hey, we don't want to lose the cell. Some of a five ton heat pump. But make sure you put it in there where it said no load calculation was performed. So if it comes back later on and you're just not keeping up or oversized radically, you're not responsible. Contractor made that decision to choose the equipment. Do I want to go air or do I want to water? If I have anything other than a watered air application, a single ducted delivery system, it's probably water to water. We have a tri blend unit. I shouldn't say we have. Competition has a tri blend unit, a tri fuel unit where what they'll do is in floor radiant heat, forced air heat, or forced air chilling. You have to choose as to which unit you want to run. You cannot do all three or two of them at the same time. With our water to water, I can do in floor radiant heat. I can do forced air heat. I can do ice melt if need to. I can do pool heating if I want to. I can do domestic water heating if I want to. So by far the water to water has the most features and capabilities. And it's pretty forgiving as well. If we're gonna go air, you have to choose is upflow, downflow, or horizontal. If you choose downflow, it's not a product of the SM. There'll be a product of the CE. It's a different unit that has downflow capability. Again, the code sheet will spell it out for you as to what the options are. Your duct connections, again, left or right hand return, split systems, KW, loop build is a closed loop, open loop, boiler tire, Cooper nickel or copper, check off, check off. When you get done, you can order the equipment in. If you're very confident about what you're getting will be the right product your application. Electrical options, even some commercial options if you get into unique application for commercial, such as the hot gas reheat, two-way valve, economizer, DDC, hot gas bypass. Guys, hot gas bypass, hot gas reheat sound very similar. Concepts maybe, hot gas reheat is what we showed you a picture of. Two coils in one air handler along with the coaxial. Hot gas bypass, is when I take a line right from the hot gas and run it to the suction line to keep my suction pressure up so it doesn't freeze the coil or create issues with the compressor. Hot gas bypass is not near as efficient as hot gas reading is, but we do have both for you in the commercial world. Your voltages, your phases, and then last but not least, there's your 40 digit code string, and then you can take that number and compare it to the 10 digit order equipment. Wow. A lot of stuff just to get through the heat pump. In review, let the contractor fill that sheet out. If not, let the, con the counter people fill it out with the contractor. File it, document it. That way, if something comes in wrong, you got you got a way out. Guys, it's not to say that we don't make mistakes. Everybody does. There are no mistakes in life, just learning experiences. Learning experiences. The engineering submittal sheet will give you all the parameters to what output capacities you have at different water temperatures as well. So options not seen doesn't mean we can do. We are a custom shop, not like we used to be, but we still can do some custom building. Every piece of equipment will have a code sheet. Use your code sheet for what options are available. Additional items needed to complete the install. A lot of the early days, we bought, we bought the box. That's all we need. And guys, in reality, when that guy walks out with that heat pump, these other items are all needed. And they're either going to buy it from you or they're going to go to somewhere else that has all the products. The Unicoles or straight pipe. That'd be your loop fill. Where am I getting the energy from underground? Headers, internal, external, flow centers, pressurized or non-pressurized. I am a big non-pressurized guy. I love non-pressurized. There's many advantages that are out there, but you can go pressure if you want. You can do non-pressure. We'll work with both. 
Antifreeze, remember the true purpose of antifreeze? Protecting the coaxial heat exchanger. We need a thermostat, face pad, hose kit, PP ports, temperature pressure ports, filtration, canvas, and disconnect. All of these items <laughs> are accessories that go with the heat pump. A lot of times it will almost double the cost of the heat pump to get all the accessories. If you don't have all the items, you can't make the heat pump work. Frustration sets in when you walk out of the heat pump realizing you need all these other components. So when it comes to commercial equipment, this is pulled off the site. This is Bosch Heating and Cooling, just like it sounds, BoschHeatingAndCooling.com. When you get to that site, choose commercial or residential products. Commercial is FHP. You see from the sheet, we have our water to air, water to air large, water to water, and then even rooftop packages. We're going to start with the LM. The LM unit is the, is the cream of the crop. It's the best that we have in a commercial line. Constant ECM blowers. We have the split. The LM split is the only split available now in commercial. It is two stage, two to six ton. ES, it's one size under, a little more economical in cost, two to six ton. We have our EP, which is third, that's going back to a single stage blower or single stage unit, half to six ton with an X13. We have our LV. The LV is replacing the SV. The SV used to have all kind of options. The SV doesn't have those options anymore, but the LV does. Quick look at some of the options that we have available. Up, up, there we go. So under the LV options, we have our blowers listed down here. So we can go through this and actually see what do we mean by our options. So we have our blowers. Didn't mean to move that quick. So we have our blower motors, plated coils, cell insulation, EMS relay, disconnects, DDC. If you have questions, this is available to read on. Hot gas reheat. Extended range, filtrations, water valves, compressor blankets, soft starts, comfort alerts, heat recovery packages, duct mounted heaters, super nickel heat exchangers. This gives you a list of pretty much all the options that are available for GEO. Once again, if it's not on the code sheet, it's not available for that unit. Our compressors, half to one ton. They are Tecumseh's. One and a half tons are LG, and then two to six ton are Copeland. So we have three different compressors we're using now in our system. We have our EC, which is about driven six to 30 ton. And we have our MC, which is the modular design heat pump that means we can take it apart and bring it in pieces to assemble inside the room. We don't need to now cap Cut a huge hole in the wall to bring that in. We have console units and we have rooftop units. And then we have our water to water units in the commercial line. Two to six ton. That is a unit mounted controller shown on the display board on the front of that unit. I would use caution on UMCs. Usually without is a better fit for installs. And then our 1035 ton water to water. Residential, same format, same application. Just choose residential, SM, cream to crop. It is the best of the best. Our newest version is the SMC. Remember, it's just like SM Classic or A, the SMB and C. It's just the control system now is gearing up with Wi-Fi capability, but you must be at the unit within 15 feet. It's going to give you a computer output that's going to show you if compressor and pump are running. What are the temperatures of the uh, refrigerate, water temperatures, and then we determine our freeze protection, open loop, close loop from those parameters with the app. CE, that is our downflow unit. So if you need to do a downflow, it's the CE unit. Our BP is a single stage. They've dropped that from one to four ton now. It used to be one to six, it's only one to four. Our SV, 
half to six tons. Once again, our three compressors remain the same. Small fractionals, half to one are Tecumseh's, one and a half are LG, and then two to six are Copa and Ultratech schools. Water to water, two to five ton. The six ton has been wiped out. We do not offer a six ton residentially. We do offer six ton commercially. And we have our TW12 too, which is a 10 ton. We'll call it Resmercial. More on the commercial line. It has legs on it, single pan underneath. It is a little noisier in home applications. If you're limited for size, not a lot of equipment, then you have to go with the TW12 too. The better fit would be two TW5 tons. I read the sale number on Boston equipment. The first four digits are plant. The second grouping is the date code. The third grouping is the warranty code. The fourth one is the counter number. And the last is the part number. The part number is a critical one, guys, gals, because that's how we know if we're having a problem with a particular stocking of TXVs by that part number. This breaks down that serial number. This is our date code, how we look at the equipment. Year that shit's going to go four, and if we go to 2020, right now the fourth month would be 040. That chart is available by your rep if you need to have that. Last but not least, on the commercial, if we're going commercial, <clears throat> the big difference between residential and commercial product it's the same equipment, same coil, same controls, same compressor. It's all about the warranty. Commercial has a one-year warranty, or residential carries a 10-year warranty, 10-year on parts and labor. Commercial carries 90-day labor, one-year parts. Unless I add my extended warranty purchases, which we can go five years on parts or refrigerant and labor if you want. It's by the eighth and ninth digit of the serial number of that unit. It requires it coming from Bosch. These are the modules that are available out there that we'll offer for you. Uh, if you have a desire to go into more, we can bring them up in an individual training. We get ourselves back out there doing the training from the webinars. I thank you for your time and attention. We're going to have Lane open up that for questions. We'll try to get a couple of these questions answered up for you.